um, the second chapter last time, um, we're coming off of a very high vantage point. This, this la last chapter was a, was a pretty uh, grand overview of the purpose of God in Christ as Jesus has been administering it in the church. And as we move into the third chapter, I confess yet again, I've had a kind of a hard time figuring out where to cut this off. So I'm, I'm going to focus on the first two verses, but we're going to kind of hop around up to verse 9 as well. I may go back and sit on some of this a little later. Now, the, um, as we begin chapter 3, Paul gives us kind of an ex explanatory uh, testimony, as it were. He gives us um, uh, a view of the part that he's been given to play in this work. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to talk about to begin with is the idea of Paul being a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know, the idea that Jesus would actually actively and presently purpose and allow for a man to remain as an innocent man being held captive by another man. I think that you would find that there are a great deal of people in our day, you know, the, the Joyce Myers and Kenneth Copelands of our day would probably cast out your name as evil to even suggest this. This sounds, this sounds wrong, antithetical to a lot of people's view of who Jesus is. But this, this happened. This is, is, is Jesus at work here. Um, it, the, the fact that it could actually be the will of God for a man to be a prisoner is something that some people can't wrap their head around. You know, w would God do something like this? Now, um, uh, as, as it concerns Paul himself, this is actually not the first time that Paul has had this experience. Um, in the record of Scripture, God has purposely ordered happenings for allowing an innocent man to be a prisoner before, even in his life. Um, he had this experience where he was he was jailed if for no other reason than to convert his his very own jailer. So he 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 understood the the, the whole concept of what was what was going on here. And as I was thinking about this, I couldn't uh, be helped to to be drawn to Joseph. I think that Brother Joseph could probably testify to you the truth of this, that God can and does sometimes purpose bondage for an innocent man. Yet he could also testify that God, God never does anything without purpose and that regardless of whether or not a man intended it for evil, God intended it for good. And, and uh, we see in this kind of a, a, a type in Joseph, it's a, the same in him and Paul, is that their bondage actually served to the liberation of many others. Now, as, I was, I, as I was looking at this, I, I, was, I, I was actually kind of, I know, I've never seen this before in this, this aspect of it, that at the time of the infancy of the formation of the nation of Israel, and also at the time of the infancy of the formation of the church, in both instances, an individual who played a critical role in being used of God to help provide for the sustenance that was needed to, to get this work started, were both called to be prisoners of the Lord. It was actually purpose in, in both of these that were very similar. In both cases, there was a purpose involved which would make provision to save many people alive. Their being taken from the freedom that they once had was in order to give them influence that they otherwise would not have had. And in both instances, uh, in, in Paul's instance and Joseph's, they were both like model prisoners, so to speak. And as a result, they were also given a special favor. They were actually, they were actually workers in their bondage. It was actually something that, that uh, for them was a, uh, it was profitable. Now, this was the manner of the working out of Paul's God-given task, his commission to be the messenger of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Uh, he calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Uh, this was, you remember, the nature of the Jews' accusation against him. In, in, in the chapter previous to this great tumult in the temple, that he had instructed men not to circumcise and to do all manner of things contrary to the law. And it was by consequence of his relations with and preaching to the Gentiles that this bondage came to be. And also... Uh, it's, it was also the purpose of the bondage itself. It actually served to his ministry to the Gentiles. He was preeminently, however, a prisoner of Jesus Christ by his determination and by his direction. And that being said, however, Paul's imprisonment was actually not a hindrance to his work as the apostle to the Gentiles, but actually, you know, contrary to the wisdom of man, this was actually a, compl a complimented it. 
And uh, in Philippians, he, he he explained this to the brethren. He, he he talked to them about this. He said that, but I would you I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto, unto me have actually fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So this, this was like the mode of operation, as it were, for the vehicle through which it would be finished. As far as the, the circumstance on the earth is concerned, the, the, this, this was not mere chance. This was all ordered. This was according to the will and determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. This, you know, this imprisonment, although to the flesh, it was certainly at the very least inconvenient and uncomfortable, if not at times painful and oppressive, it actually in it, built into it had a certain mercy from the Lord as well. See, there's, there's a sense in which at times he actually had more freedom to preach and testify being a prisoner of Rome than he would have had if he was just a devout Pharisee turned follower of Jesus. And as, as far as I can see, there's two main reasons for this. And first, because this provided, as it were, an armed escort. You know, at any given point in time, Paul had like a state-sanctioned bodyguard against the Jews. But beginning with his deliverance from the mob of these angry Jewish men who no doubt would have killed them had they not been stopped. That was their intent. And they were in the process of doing so, but they were interrupted by, by, a, by a mightier force. And he was from this point on, in one, in one sense, protected. He, even in the midst of this bondage, there was like a shield to him. You remember later there were those who gave an oath that they would not eat, you know, in, until they had killed Paul. Now, there were those who, you know, I, I, I thought about this too. I've wondered, do you think that those men didn't, didn't fulfill their oath? Or do you really think any of them starved themselves to death? <laughs> Yet none of these intentions were allowed to prosper against him, largely because he was shielded from this small band of radical Jews by the outward military might of the Praetorian Guard. You know, there's really no, there was no... Uh, um, competition between those two things, between his opposition and the and the the thing, people he had guarding him. Also, his detainment and his awaiting trial was the means of putting him into contact with countless Gentile individuals, uh, centurions, captains, all the people who who saw these proceedings going on, and it also provided him opportunity for public testimony to the most important political figures in the region at the time. You know, I had thought about this. What really would Paul have had to do to work out hearings with these men himself? Would he, would he, would he have been able to do that? I, I would venture to say that it would probably literally would have been impossible for him to set himself up in these situations. How, and, and not only that, but how could Paul have um, captured the attention of so many men in the Gentile world to sit through his testimony unless they were just giving curious attention to a man on trial? You know, I, I think a lot of people who listened to what was going on, they, they were simply listening to Paul give a defense for himself, they thought, yet they were unwittingly being exposed to the testimony of Jesus by the direction of the Lord. All these things were being, were being worked out in Paul being a prisoner. And we can see how God orchestrated all the circumstances, lined everything up for, for him to be able to enter into this. But we also see that God granted Paul wisdom as well in order to deal with these situations wisely, deal with them appropriately, use these open doors that God had given him to the furtherance of the gospel. Now, beyond the situation with Paul, as I was thinking about this, and uh, all that we can see in what was involved in his circumstances, we see about God beholding this, that he will not always deliver us from trouble. In fact, there are times where he will deliberately deliver us unto trouble, and that grace delivered unto us is not always for a deliverance, but sometimes for perseverance in trial. And it is all, not always given that we may be spared, but that ha having been empowered, we may overcome. Amen. So after being initially rescued from the hands of his abusers in the temple, we see that Paul stood, give to testimony and explanation. And in the ensuing uproar, his subsequent apprehension, as he was lined up to be examined by scourging, he, he had a direction in this. He had wisdom to appeal to his rights as affor afforded as a Roman citizen. 
In giving his defense before the Jewish council, he had wisdom to perceive that half of the body of them were Pharisees and the other half was Sadducees, so that he actually caused a division among them. I, I, according to the hope of the, 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 the resurrection from the dead, am I called into question? And the Pharisees said, wait a minute. So after hearing the plot to kill him, uh, Paul had wisdom to direct that witness of these things to the Roman guard, you know. So in, in that, all the circumstances were being ordered. But we, we see in all that that Paul was, had willingly entered into this. He, he, was, he played a part in this. And when the proceeding dragged on after his testimony to Felix, and when Festus would have sent him back to Jerusalem to testify, he had wisdom then to appeal to Caesar. So at every point, through every obstacle, regardless of the intentions of his enemies to destroy him and, and, and uh, get him off track, he was able to stand at these times. He was able to be bold, to bear witness in all good conscience. He wasn't overcome by his accusers, neither did he seek preeminently justice for himself. Yet at the same time, he did not simply sit by and allow himself to be taken advantage of. You know, I, I thought about the words of Jesus when he, he spoke about this type of circumstance that we're going to come to his disciples when he says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpent and harmless as doves. He's, he's, he, this is the exact circumstance that he's in here. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up unto the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for the testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought about how or what you shall speak, for it will be given you in that hour what you shall speak. We see Paul as a living testimony to this, to testify to the fact that this is true. For it is not you that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. Now, Paul is a faithful example of one who traversed this landscape of persecution and opposition blamelessly, yet simultaneously wisely uh, unto the glory of God. Now, ultimately, Paul mastered this spiritual art, as it were, of using what God had given him in form of resource, location, and available influence to accomplish as much as he possibly could for the furtherance of the gospel and the increase of the kingdom of heaven. And actually, uh, as I was uh, rehearsing these things in Acts again, the Lord granted him at the end of the record of Acts to have a measure of favor and license that uh, you could hardly read of, uh, of his situation and associate it with a prisoner. It almost reads like he's not, he's not a prisoner anymore. I mean, this is how much favor he was granted. It says, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Now he continues on in the third chapter here, in the second of, of third verse, to speak of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given unto him for the, on the behalf of the Gentiles. I, as I was thinking about this, I was, uh, I was thankful and impressed by what God accomplished through Paul as a speaker and as a writer. It, it, Paul really is the primary communicator of a bulk of what we have been given to know about the implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you look merely at the volume of writing compared to the other apostles, let alone the depth of the content, there is ample evidence that he did indeed, as he testified, labor more abundantly than they all. We see that in Paul, this was a vessel in, in, into which God invested much. And you can't really read very, Paul, very far in Paul's epistles to find things that you can't find anywhere else. This is a, it's a very unique witness. You know, and I was thinking about this. It's, it's no wonder that we have a spiritual, spiritual condition in the church that we have today. It's because the writings of the Apostle Paul have been, uh, have been set to the wayside. You know, we, we, this is a, something that has been a, a situation for a very long time that people are, have been neglecting the Old Testament. They've been ne neglecting, you know, a, as, if, as if the Old Covenant is somehow obsolete. Well, if you take that and pair it with the neglect of the epistles, then what really do you have left? 
If, if you don't have the record of the Old Testament, the record of the prophets, then you really don't have any context into which a Savior can come into the world. And if you don't have the implications of that Savior coming into the world, then what really are you left with other than merely the record of the earthly circumstances of Jesus in the world? I think that for... for a lot of people, that's the reason why Jesus is so misunderstood, why his words are twisted so far, because they they have no context in which they can understand what it means for Jesus to be the Christ, that he was, he was promised of God and that he was promised, chosen for a purpose to be a vessel to, to, to pay for the sins of the world. However, wherever familiarity with the Word of God is found, joined with a tender spirit, submitted heart and mind, what is recorded in the epistles by this apostle opens up a whole new vista of truth. Amen. Now, I, I, there's a couple things here that I thought about that this is something that you can only get from the apostle Paul. There's are things that only he really spoke in length about. Detailed teaching about the mediation and the high priesthood of Jesus. If you want to know about that, you have to read it, about it from the, the Apostle Paul. Details concerning the operation of God in baptism. The fact that we're buried into Jesus' death and raised with his life. All, all, all the implications that are involved in there, you're going to have to go to the book of Romans to read about that. Teaching concerning the Lord's table. Detailed teaching about the new man and about the old man, about what has happened in, in God putting his spirit in us and us being revived and renewed in the spirit of our mind. If you want to know about that, you're going to have to read about it from this apostle. Detailed teaching concerning the new covenant, concerning the fulfillment of the shadows that were contained in the tabernacle service in Jesus. What all of that really meant, you're going to have to read about that from the apostle Paul. Teaching concerning marriage and its purpose, the fact that it is to be a mirror of the church in Christ. That this, you remember what he said about this. He said, Look, th "This is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church." If you want to read about that, you have to read about it from Paul. An exposition of the purpose of God as it concerns the church as a whole. In the book of Ephesians, you're going to read about that. And the administration of Jesus as head over all things to the church, both in the present and its various offices and functions, how, how Jesus is, is working in the body. And beyond this world, the church in aggregate as the great cloud of witnesses that, that we all be, are able to behold, as well as throughout eternity as the church being built up as being the habitation of God in the spirit. All these things are unique to, to, to the Apostle Paul. Uh, at the end of this, or uh, end of these verses here in the third chapter, verses seven through nine, I thought this, this was a good sim summary of what Paul was enabled to do by the Lord. He says, "Were I, but I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power, unto me who am the least of all saints is this grace given." This is what he was given grace for, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What an, what an occupation. How do, you, how do you preach something that's unsearchable? Well, God enabled Paul to be able to do it. He, he, he enabled Paul to do it. And to make men see. How difficult is it to make men see? That's something that only the Lord's able to do, but he was able to do it through Paul. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So this is in summary what the Paul was enabled by God to do, the impossible, really, to proclaim what he had never been before proclaimed, open up what no man prior was able to open up. He gave him knowledge that was hidden from the beginning of the world. How do you find out something that was hidden from the beginning of the world? And enable them to communicate that, both in the right words and in the most appropriate manner as to successfully propagate that message to believers at large in the world. We have today a book of his writings. I think that that was pretty successful. That was a, he, he spoke those words a long time ago. So we all, even unto this day, owe a great debt of gratitude to the working of God in this faithful, tenacious man of God, the Apostle Paul. Thank you, brother.